This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, let's get started. So today video segment is about uh, tactile sensing. Now, I wonder what is difficult about building tactile sensors? Anyone has an idea? So what is the problem with building a tactile sensor? Oh, you used to see the video first, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, do you need a perturbation to be able to see what you're touching sometimes? Um, well, yeah, sometimes you, I mean, uh, human tactile sensing is amazing. So you have uh, the static information. So if you grab something, now the whole surface is in contact and you can determine the shape, right? So what does it mean in terms of uh, like designing a tactile sensor? Just if you think about the static case. It must be soft, valuable, malleable. Yeah, you need some softness in the skin you are putting. Then you need to take this whole information, uh, what kind of resolution you need if you are touching feel the edge. You need a lot of pixels, right? So how can you take this information and first of all, how you determine that information? What kind of um, procedure you, yes? Well, I mean, there's, there's an element of pressure, like how hard you're, the average, how you're, mm -hmm. hard you're touching on all these things. Okay. So you can imagine maybe a sort of a resistive or capacitive sensor that will deflect a little bit and uh, give you that uh, information. How many of those you would need? You need sort of an array, right? So how large? Like, let's say this is the end of factor. trying to see if you get that problem you're going to have a lot of information here and you need to take it back and you have a lot of wires you have a matrix and you're going to have a lot of basically information to to transmit so the design of tactile sensors bring this problem of how we can put enough uh, sensors and how we can extract this information and take it back. So these guys came up with uh, an interesting idea. Here it is. Uh, the light, please. A novel tactile sensor using optical phenomenon was developed. In the tactile sensor shown here, Light is injected at the edge of an optical waveguide made of transparent material and covered by an elastic rubber cover. There is clearance between the cover and the waveguide. The injected light maintains total internal reflection at the surface of the waveguide and is enclosed within it. When an object makes contact with it, the rubber cover depresses and touches the waveguide. Scattered light arises at the point of contact due to the change of the reflection condition. Such tactile information can be converted into a visual image. Using this principle, a prototype finger-shaped tactile sensor with a hemispherical surface was developed. A CCD camera is installed inside the waveguide to detect scattered light arising at the contact location on the sensor surface. The image from the CCD camera is sent to the computer and the location of the scattered light is determined by the image processing software. Using this information, the object's point of contact on the sensor surface can be calculated. To improve the size and the operational speed of the sensor, 
a miniaturized version was developed. The hemispherical waveguide with cover, the light source infrared LEDs, a position sensitive detector for converting the location of the optical input into an electric signal, and the amplifier circuit were integrated in the sensor body. The scattered light arising at the point of contact is transmitted to the detector through a bundle of optical fibers. By processing the detector's electric signal by computer, it is possible to determine the contact location on the sensor surface in 1.5 milliseconds. Through further miniaturization, a fingertip diameter of 20 millimeters has been achieved in the latest version of the tactile sensor. It is currently planned to install this tactile sensor in a robotic hand with the aim of improving its dexterity. Okay. Uh, a cool idea, right? Uh, because now you're taking this information and transmit and taking it into a visual uh, image and transmitting the image. And uh, in fact, this was done long time ago. Um, I, I believe um, the emperor of Japan was visiting that laboratory and I, he saw this and he was quite impressed. Um, be before starting the lecture, just uh, wanted to remind you that uh, we are going to have uh, two review sessions on Tuesday and Wednesday uh, <coughs> next week. And uh, uh, we will uh, again sign up for two groups. I hope we will have a balance between those who are coming on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, we will uh, do the signing up next uh, Monday. So those who are not here today, be sure to come on Monday to sign up. All right? OK. Last lecture, we discussed uh, the control structure. We were talking still about one degree of freedom. And we are going to pursue that discussion with one degree of freedom. So we are looking at a model, the dynamic model of a mass moving at some acceleration, x double dot, and controlled by a force F. So the control of this robot is done through this proportional derivative controller involving minus kp, uh, x minus x desired, and minus kv, x dot. So the kp is your position gain, and the kv is your velocity gain. Now, if we take this blue controller and move it to the left, the closed loop behavior is going to be written as the second order equation. And in this equation, we can see that we have a sort of mass spring damper system <coughs> whose wrist position is at the desired xd position. So kv is your velocity gain, and kp is the position gain. Now, if we rewrite this equation by dividing it by m, we are going to be able to see what closed loop frequency we have and what damping ratio we have. And every time at the lecture time, this finishes. So, <laughs> so what is your closed loop frequency? Kp is equal 10, and uh, the mass is equal 1. What is the closed loop frequency? Square root of 10. And what is the damping ratio? A little bit more complicated, but we can rewrite the same equation in this form. 2 zeta omega and omega square, where omega is your closed loop frequency and where Zeta is this coefficient, kv divided by 2 square root of km, 
and omega is simply the closed loop frequency square root of kp divided by m. So you remember this. But now, the difference with before, before we had natural frequency, so we were talking about natural frequency and natural damping ratio. Now this is your gain and you are closing the loop, so this is your control gain, it's the closed loop damping ratio and the closed loop frequency, okay? So the only difference is instead of a natural system with spring and damper, now we are artificially creating a frequency through this closed loop or we're creating this damping ratio through KV. So basically this is what you are going to try to do. You're going to take your robot, you're going to find those gains, KP and KV, and try to control the robot with those gains. So again, thinking about KP and KV, KV is affecting zeta, right? And KP is also affecting your omega. Now, when you're going to control your robot, what, what is the objective? What are you going to try to do? Let's think about it. You're trying to go somewhere, right? Or you're trying to track a trajectory. So what do you want to achieve with those? I mean, here is your behavior. What, do you, wh what would be good to achieve here? Yes. Frequency and critical damping. So we want to have a critically damped system most of the time. So we will uh, reach those goal positions as quickly as possible without oscillation. So KV uh, would be selected to achieve that value. And for that critically damped system, what is the value of zeta? Anyone remembers? It was only two days ago. Zeta is equal to, for critically damped system, zeta is equal to the unity, 1. When zeta is equal to 1, that is when kV is equal to 2 square root of kPm, you have critically damped system. So basically, if you know your kP, if you already selected your kP, and if you want critically damped system, then immediately you can compute KV from <coughs> M and KP, right? For that value, for zeta. So basically, you are trying to set zeta. What about omega? So now we need to set KP in order to compute zeta. And how do we set omega? Someone, Matthew. Okay, no idea? So you have your, your Puma, you go and you want to control, let's say, joint three. We can do it if you want. Where are my glasses? Here is the simulator. Oh, that doesn't have an effector. Let's take this one. <coughs> so, here are your gains. And right now, if we ask the robot to, so the robot is floating. And if we ask the robot to go to its zero position, it's going to just move. And it's moving with a KP equal 400 and KV equal 40. These are the gain we set for the robot. But in fact, uh, 
this is controlled also with dynamics. So we will get to this little later, <laughs> but if we want to, to see the control without dynamics, we take this probably non-dynamic joint control, so this one. So let's float it a little bit. Actually, I can exert a little force outside and see if it can move. It's really solid. Well, you can not move it too much. So let's reduce the gain here. So the springness KP is 40. So see now if I apply a force, there is a deflection, right? And when I'm going to release, it's going to go there, oscillate a little bit, tiny bit, not too much. In fact, I, th this has a, a lot of friction, natural friction. If we remove the friction and do the same thing, it will probably oscillate more. Mm, not enough. Okay. Wow. Still there is friction? No. So let's put a little bit minus, how much minus two? <laughs> this is minus 20, I think it will go unstable. Wow. <laughs> so <coughs> so we, we, we see that your gain cannot be negative, it will, oh. Can you stop? <laughs> Okay, we need some friction, otherwise it will not stop. Ah. So, so, in fact, uh, uh, you can see there is a lot of coupling. I move just one <coughs> joint and everything else is moving. Let's make uh, this gain bigger. This is joint one. So if I pull on joint two and release, <coughs> look at joint three, what is happening? So there is an inertial coupling coming from joint two on joint three. Just by moving joint two, you are affecting joint three. You can see, uh, again, joint two, release, and joint three is moving. <coughs> so, in order to avoid that uh, disturbance coming from the dynamic, what, what should we do? with KP. Make it smaller or bigger. Yeah. You're not sure? Should we try it? So let's uh, make it bigger. How big? 400, okay, 400. Now you realize with 400, uh, this is not damped enough because we need to compute uh, uh, this to make it a little bigger. So let's make it 20. Okay. So now what do you expect? the disturbance will increase or w will be reduced when I'm going to release? More disturbance or less? 
he is less who agrees with less okay and who disagree with less uh, everyone else <laughs> okay so this is less yeah it is less actually <coughs> You, you're, you're moving little faster and you are, you are still oscillating and the oscillation is because we don't have enough damping here. So if we increase the, the damping, it will oscillate less. And if we increase the gain, do you see what is happening now? It's going very quickly to its position. So, in fact, the, the coupling, this is the degree. You look at the 90 degree between joint link 2 and link 3. It is maintained almost. In fact, if I increase joint 2 as well, it will be hard to move it. So what is happening now with the, with the response? Do you see the response when we went to 1600? Faster or slower? Hmm? Slower? Faster. So, so the dynamic response of the closed loop is faster with higher gain. Well then, should we increase it, like keep increasing? I don't know, we can try. So what is the limit? So l let's make it 3,000. <coughs> now joint three is locked. It's not moving anymore. Should we make it more? Okay. So what's going to happen? It's not moving anymore. It's now, the problem, if this was a real robot, would 30,000 work? Why? Your motor's going to saturate at some level. And well, suppose you have big motors. Yeah, the saturation of the motors is one thing, but suppose you, you have really big motors, it's not the limitation. Would you have some sort of um, air drift? Well, well, we'll discuss it a little later, but uh, essentially what is going to happen is that, you remember uh, inside, inside <laughs> the structure you have motors, you have transmissions, you have gears, and all of these are going to move and they have flexibility in the structure. This flexibility makes it that you start to excite those mode of the flexible system. And as you start moving, the motors start to vibrate. And if you have flexibility in the structure, the structure starts to vibrate. And when you hit those frequencies of vibration, the system will just go unstable. So, our KP, this KP that we want, oh, we closed it, just one second, let's go back to, So this KP we have here, this KP cannot go too high. We want it as high as possible to increase what? What, what it does when KP is high? 
disturbance rejection because errors uh, coming, uh, dynamic coupling coming from other links will be rejected. It's stiffer. However, KP cannot go too high because KP is deciding the closed loop frequency. And this closed frequency can go as high as those unmodeled flexibilities. Actually, we cannot even come close to them. We have to stay away from them. So omega cannot be too high, which means Kp can has a limit. But we want to achieve the highest Kp. So what is the relationship between Kp, Kv, and those performance? So from those two equations, we can write Kp is m omega square and kv is m to zeta omega, right? Just rewriting these two equations and computing kv and kp. So, when we are controlling a system, we are going to set what? We're going to set really the dynamics of the system, which means we, w we need to set zeta and omega. So we set zeta and omega and we can compute our kp and kv. Most of the time zeta is equal to 1 so kv is m2 omega and so all what is left is to set omega. So for 400 omega is equal to what? In the case of the poma in the simulation, we have 400 kp. So omega is equal to. Come on. Square root divided by. We, we, well, m is equal to 1, let's say, in that case. It's 20. It's 20 multiply, uh, what is the frequency, the real frequency? Uh, omega, over two pi. omega divided by 2 pi. Right. So what is your frequency about, let's say, divide by 6, 20 divided by 6. So it's very low, 3, 4 hertz. In fact, if you're lucky, you can go, well, to 10 hertz, I mean, this would be great. So when we go to 1600, this is, this is, uh, this is really nice. 40 divided by 6. Well, in practice, you start with very low gains, and you start tuning your gains up, 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 and suddenly you're going to hit that noise start to vibrate, so go down. But we will see uh, some ways of doing this uh, in a more uh, precise way. But again, what you are seeing here is Kp and Kv. Now, if we think about two different links, one link that is heavy and one link that is light, m equal 1 and m equal 100. Your gain Kp is going to be, for the same frequency, is going to be much, much bigger for the bigger link. So that gain is scaled by the mass. And because it is scaled by the mass, we can think about the problem of setting the gains for the unit mass system. You remember we said if I'm moving joint 2, the inertia of joint 2 is changing. Big, small. So we need to be able to somehow account for the fact, so I set my frequency. I set omega and set zeta. And now I computed Kp and Kv, but M doubled. So I need to update my gains, right? If I want to 
move with the same closed loop frequency, I need somehow to update my gains. And that becomes nonlinear control. So we talk about the unit mass gains. So let's just imagine that your system, this mass was unit mass. Your gains will be simply omega squared and 2 zeta omega, which is for 1, this would be 2 omega. Very simple. Just set to omega, and you get your kp and kv. Okay? But we know the system is not going to be a unit mass. So, for the, this M mass system, what are the gains? gains from this kp prime and kv prime. What would be kp for m, a system with mass m, using kp prime? kp will be m times kp prime. And kv, just linear. So you take m and you scale your gains. Okay? Well, what is the big deal about this? Why I'm talking about it? Well, the big deal is that M is going to change. So even for one uh, changing mass, you can make this nonlinear and scale and track a constant frequency and constant damping ratio. But for a system with many degrees of freedom, we have a mass matrix and we are going to use the same concept. We are going to say, I look at the unit mass system and then I scale the unit mass system with the mass matrix and everything will work exactly in the same way. And I will be compensating for the variation of the mass. This is the nonlinear dynamic decoupling that we're going to introduce. And it is based on the idea that I design the unit mass system and then I will scale the unit mass system with the mass matrix. Well, in this case, it is just a, a scalar, simple mass. So this is what we call the control partitioning if I have a system with a mass M, I basically <coughs> decompose it in the mass and the unit mass system. So the blue is the unit mass system and M is the scaling of the unit mass system. So I can now design a controller for the unit mass system with Kp prime and Kv prime. And then the Kp and Kv for the original system will be just scaled by that mass. So here is my controller F. I'm going to write it as M time F prime, where F prime is this quantity, a PD controller designed for unit mass. So we always denote these as primes of kv or kp. So when we say prime, we are talking about the unit mass, mass system. The controller of the unit mass system, f prime. And f is m times that f prime. That will make more sense when we go to the multi-degree of freedom controller because m becomes the mass matrix. Okay? So, <coughs> essentially, we have our initial system that is now controlled as a unit mass system scaled by the mass itself. And the behavior of the whole system is like this. Well, the dynamic behavior, the dynamic response and the damping ratio are like this. But we have to be careful about other characteristics like disturbance rejection, stiffness. They are not. And we will see that in a second. The dynamic behavior of the closed loop is like this. 
So you design your controller for the unit mass, and basically if you scale with that mass, then you have the behavior of the unit mass. Okay, so in this case, what is omega for this system? It is simply the square root of kp prime. And, uh, okay, now we are going to introduce one more element. We talked about it on Monday, and this is just a tiny nonlinearity. Let's add some friction. So, we started with the system without any nonlinearity, and now I'm just adding a little bit of friction, nonlinear friction, like uh, some stiction on that joint. So the equation changed completely. That is, it's not nonlinear anymore. We cannot uh, just uh, treat it as a linear system, and we have to deal with uh, a controller that is going to be nonlinear. So, how can we deal with this? Come on, ideas. So you have your your joint, and it has a gear with like some some friction that is, uh, or even uh, uh, it has some gravity, or whatever. Yes. Well, if, if you've got a certain type of friction, you can uh, like if it's velocity, then you can put that into the motion equation and mm -hmm. comp and change your b value. Your your K D K V you you mean yeah yeah K. the K V so if if it is uh, linear yeah I I think uh, you you can in fact in, in, into integrate it directly in the K V but if it is not nonlinear like just uh, the gravity so what do we do if we if we have the gravity what do we do with the gravity. We model it. I know the model. Because I know the mass, the center of mass, all of these things. So, if I can model it, I can somehow like anticipate what the gravity is going to be and try to comp compensate for it. Very good. So, we can compensate for the gravity. Well, if we have a nonlinear term, what we will do is we put that compensation in the controller. So now the controller, it has the linear part, which was f prime, alpha f prime. Alpha f prime actually is mass f prime. And now we are going to add another term, beta which will attempt to compensate for B. You do not know B exactly. You know sort of a model with some estimate of B. You don't know X exactly. You don't know X dot exactly. You have estimate of these. What we call the X hat, X dot hat, and B hat. Now, B has a structure. If it's the gravity, it's going to be, I don't know, ML cosine that angle. And you can estimate your mass, estimate your length, estimate the, the, the position, and come up with an estimate of B, which, we, which would be B hat. So, in that case, you can say alpha is simply the mass, an estimate of the mass, minus plus one gram probably you will find it and your b hat is going to be an estimate of of b given the state your estimate of the state and you probably have 10 epsilons <laughs> a little bit more of error so we're assuming that we are going to have some errors but by compensating for those nonlinearities estimating the gravity and taking it out, 
later estimating centrifugal Coriolis forces and trying to taking them out, we should be able to bring the closed loop system closer to a system that is a unit mass system. Because with this compensation, if everything was perfect, we compensated perfectly B, then basically beta will take out B. For each configuration, each velocity, beta is exactly compensating for B, it takes it out, and the system is linearized. Right? Well, this will never happen in reality, but we will be very close. So this is what we can write. We can say, this is our system, and this is the controller. You understand this controller? This controller is a nonlinear controller, but it is attempting to render in the closed loop your system to become the coupled linear system. So here is the result. If B and B hat were identical, if B hat was compensating perfectly for B, and if the estimate of the mass matrix later, this mass was identical to M, then your system will behave this way. So what you design for F prime will be part of the closed loop of the whole system. We're talking about one degree of freedom, but if we are later, we will see 20 degree of freedom, it will be the same. Okay? Well, here is how we can write this system. So, our system was F with the output X, X naught, the state. Basically, what we are doing is we are looking at the model of the system. And we are using X and X dot to estimate B, the nonlinearities in the system, and compensate for them. So F is going to have a component which is B, B hat. In addition, our input control, which is F prime, is going to be scaled by an estimate of M, the mass of the system. So that there is a virtual system here that would look like a unit mass system with an input F prime and this same output and this big box, the red box, is like a system that is linear with unit mass. And that is the purpose of this design. Later, this will be centrifugal Coriolis gravity forces and this would be what? Right, the mass matrix. So, so in fact, with many degrees of freedom, we will be able to do the same thing where this becomes the mass matrix and here we will have V and G. You remember V? Centrifugal Coriolis and G, gravity. And you can add the, the friction as well. Okay? So, essentially we are designing a non-linear controller to compensate for centrifugal Coriolis gravity and to decouple the system, to decouple the masses, the inertial forces, and to achieve a unit mass system behavior. Okay. So, let's see our design for F prime. F prime is in this structure, in the decoupled control structure. And if you have a desired position XD, what would be F prime? just a goal position. 
So a goal position, we have x desired. F prime will be minus minus something. Who remembers? I'm sure you remember. F prime is? Minus KD prime times X dot minus KD prime times X minus XD. You, you meant minus KP prime X minus XD. So minus KV prime X dot minus KP prime X minus XD and the closed loop behavior would be very nice. So we linearize the system. All right. Well, most of the time you're not just going to a goal position. Most of the time you are tracking a trajectory. And on this trajectory you might have like you might have uh, different accelerations at different point, you have uh, different velocities, and whereas in this controller, we are just reaching to the goal position. KP prime is trying to reduce the error, and KV prime is trying to put just damping to bring the velocity to zero at the end point. But if you are tracking a trajectory, you have all of these desired things. You have desired position, function of time, desired velocity, and desired acceleration. So we need to design a controller that is more suited for this. So what F prime would be? So see, now we forget about the system because we, we know we can decouple it, make it linear. Let's think about the unit mass system, how you would design a unit mass system controller. And then you put it in that structure. So what is the objective if you have all these desired things? What should F prime be? OK. So. You see on the top, here is F prime. I have some desired acceleration. I have my acceleration, unit mass acceleration equal F prime. And I know my desired acceleration. It's X double dot desired. So if this was really a perfect system, and you are trying to track this acceleration desired, what F prime should be? I think the question is so simple that you cannot believe it. But come on, this is very simple, too simple. So my system is X double dot, and I know the desired acceleration X double dot desired. What should F prime be? Come on. Minus a constant point x double dot minus x d double dot. Yeah, I, I think you, 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 you went too far. Uh, that, is, that is correct, but I, I'm just saying if, if the system was able to respond directly to F prime with no errors, nothing, and my system is X double dot, and half the desired acceleration X double dot desired, what I would do with F prime? Just make F prime equal to X double dot desired, right? Right? Okay. Okay, you, you, you see what, what, what we're talking about? You have your de acceleration desired, so just put x double dot equal x double dot desired. And everything should just, you apply this force and the system should follow x double dot desired. Right? Well, it won't. It will drift. Because there is really no feedback. 
you, you have your acceleration and you are saying it's double that desired, this is my acceleration desired, and as soon as you start, the system will start accumulating errors and it will drift. So what should we do? We should do the PD part. And that's why now we are going to add proportional control to the error, the position error. X mi as you said, minus KP prime X minus X design. What about the error in velocity? Because now I have x dot desired. What would be the term that I should use to follow x dot desired? So that would be minus kv. Could you finish it? Minus kv. X dot minus X desired dot. Exactly. I form the error X minus X dot desired and I will. So here is the controller. So this time, if I have the full trajectory, I will form errors on the position, on the velocity, and I would feed forward the acceleration. So essentially, you are telling the system, follow this desired acceleration. It's not going, there will be errors, and I'm tightening these errors. So the closed loop behavior of this is going to be controlling the error in acceleration, in velocity, and in position, if I have the full trajectory in time. And that will basically, if I call x minus x desired the error, then I'm, I'm really controlling the error as a second order linear system, right? Okay, so now we have to make sure that we can do this with the whole robot and we have to make sure that uh, this controller could work with those gains that we are trying to achieve. And we start analyzing the system. So let's imagine that I designed the system, the compensation with the B hat, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, they are not appearing as hats, but this is B hat and M hat. And I get everything over there. But then, now we are talking about the real system. So when we were running the simulation, Already we, we saw that a small external force will disturb the system. So there are a lot of uh, forces coming from the errors in dynamics, errors in the gravity estimates, uh, nonlinear forces coming from the gears and uh, friction that will affect this behavior and as we start introducing disturbances in the system, we are going to see that these gains that we set are going to play a very important role in disturbance rejection. So, let's add a little bit of disturbance here. So, if we add some disturbance, going to take a very simple type of disturbance like a bounded disturbance that we are adding from some uh, like type of error in the gravity imagine you have this link and you have little disturbance coming from the gravity so what is the effect of this disturbance on the closed loop now so Here is our controller with F prime, scaling it by the mass estimate and B estimate. We are getting this closed loop. So this closed loop now is going 
to be equal not to zero with the disturbance force, it's going to be equal to this disturbance force divided by m, right? Uh, by the way, in some textbook, uh, this is not divided by m. It's directly applied as if it was applied to the uh, decoupled unit mass system. So, because the disturbance is at the in out uh, input of the system, you have to remember that we are dividing by m. So, this is divided by m. Okay. So let's see what is going to happen to your errors. I'm not sure how many of you know what we mean by steady state error. What is a steady state error here? What do we mean by steady state error? Yes. Well, it's reaching equilibrium velocity, how, what, its, what its position here is going to be. So steady state is like when the acceleration stops, the velocity stops, and you get you reach that position, but you are not reaching it exactly. There is a small error. So it's like a spring mass system. If you apply little per bit of uh, perturbation with uh, an external force, it's not going to go to the, its rest position. It will be very close, but not there. And that would be the steady state error. So this is what happens when we have the velocity and acceleration errors equal to zero. And that means the last term, the error term Kp prime is equal to F disturbance divided by M. And that means your error is going to be the disturbance force divided by M Kp prime. Again, in some textbook, there is no M appearing there. And this is very important. Kp prime is the gain, the position gain for the unit mass system. It renders your frequency constant over all the motion. When we vary M, Kp prime, your frequency is square root of Kp prime. However, your stiffness, your position gain is m times kp prime. And if m is changing, your stiffness is varying. So you do not have constant stiffness over the workspace as you vary m. So your error, your steady state error will vary depending on where you are and how big your m is. And you better get a large Kp prime, so to guarantee that you have a minimum uh, disturbance rejection. So, I'm not sure if you, you, you are seeing it. Kp is your stiffness, is your closed loop stiffness. Kp prime is not. It's M Kp prime. Okay? So, this is very important to uh, Remember this because we will use it when we go to n degrees of freedom. It is the same structure. Okay, well, here is the example I mentioned earlier. If we think about just a disturbance for, for this uh, one degree of freedom, it's sort of a spring mass and you are applying the disturbance force and that means the steady state error x minus x desired will be given by this equation, which means you are going to rest not at xd, but at xd plus this force divided by the stiffness you have. So this is your delta x. Okay. So the disturbance is going to produce as an error, delta x, that is given by the disturbance divided by your stiffness. And this is your m times kp prime. Don't confuse kp prime for the unit mass system and the kp. Okay, now 
How can you get rid of that error? The steady state error. Yeah, I know, I, I, I hit that slide, now you know. <laughs> you don't know, all right, <laughs> go ahead. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Do you think he didn't see the next slide? <laughs> no, you didn't see it, all right. <laughs> Okay, why, why by adding I we can, we can remove that error? Because over time the I grows large if you have a steady state error. Mm -hmm. And it'll correct for that. Yeah, but basically you detect the error and as long as you have an error you are adding, adding. So, so I essentially the idea is now your F prime will, be in will include an additional term that magnifies this error with some gain and keep magnifying and keep adding until you, you overcome uh, that disturbance. Now, integral action is, is very good to reduce errors, but you have to be careful about the way you use it. Better to use it close to your goal position, not all over, especially uh, if you, uh, you're moving fast and accelerating winding and unwinding that integral might create instabilities. So the way you can analyze the disturbance is that now you have this equation, this closed loop. And if you take the derivative of this equation, basically you see that now the steady state is going to be equal to zero. So if you build that integral, then you will take the error to zero. Actually, integral action is very nice when we go to force control. We will talk about it later. In motion control, you have to be, be very careful about its use. There is another element of this. When we looked at the simulation of the Puma, we are looking from outside. But let's go a little bit inside and see what is happening. So, you have the motor, you have a gear with some gear ratio that depends on the diameter of those two spheres R and little r. So what is the gear ratio here? Come on, we have a lot of mechanical engineers. Is it big or small? So what is a typical uh, gear ratio for, for a robot? What do you think the gear ratio for uh, joint uh, two? When I move joint two here, what is the gear ratio? That's not, that's reasonable. Actually, the gear ratios for the Puma vary between like 50 and 150. Uh, mo some robots has a 300 gear ratio and they have multiple <coughs> stages. Uh, all uh, the joints here, like uh, one, two, and three, have two stages. And you get a lot of flexibilities, a lot of vibrations that appears and all of that. So. It is, uh, it's actually very nice here because we have a very small gear ratio, but I'm not sure if you know what is the gear ratio. What is the gear ratio? About how, how big the big gear ratio is? <coughs> 20, 40? No one knows? Okay, the motor is going faster or the link is faster? I'm sorry? Motor. The motor. So the gear ratio is reducing the speed, the link is going slower. So how slower? One time, two, twice, three. 
he, he, he said like two. It's like two. Yeah, it is two. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried. <laughs> okay. So the gear ratio is really R divided by the other R, the smaller R. Okay, so that's your gear ratio. And uh, the speeds, the link speed is smaller by that ratio than the speed of the motor, right? How about the torque? Well, as it's written, so we have a gear ratio of 2 here. The torque as the link is twice as big as the torque at the motor. So you take a motor, if the gear ratio is 1, basically you have direct drive and you need a big motor to produce a torque, right? But this big motor is heavy and with the robot, putting a heavy motor here is a problem. So what do we do? We put higher and higher gear ratio, reducing the size of the motor. And we can achieve the torque because we are using a high gear ratio. Now, just I wanted to show you this to, sh to illustrate the another problem. It's not about just the speed reduction and torque uh, <coughs> increase. There is another effect that comes with the gear ratio. When we start moving, so we have this inertia, it's varying with this, right? Big inertia, small inertia as we move. Now the question is, what this motor is going to do to this inertia? The inertia of the link is here. There is another inertia coming from this rotation of the motor, and this inertia is going to be affected by the gear ratio. And the effective inertia perceived at this joint is going to be bigger than the link inertia. So what is the effect of the inertia of the rotor, of that motor there, on the inertia of the link? So the inertia of the link alone is IL. The inertia of the motor is IM. What do you expect the real IL the effective IL to be. So it's going to be equal to IL <coughs> plus something. And this something is again you? Oh, him. Okay, him. Two, twice? Twice the, the twice the inertia of the motor. So you, you mean in general this is N times the inertia of the motor? No. That's what you mean. Yeah, so it is N, the inertia of the motor. Which is similar to the torque increase. The torque at the link is N times the torque at the motor. You're saying the inertia is the same, in the same proportion, it is N times the torque, uh, I mean the inertia of the motor. Well. You're right, it is bigger. You're right, there is an increase by N, but it is not linear by N. Anyone can give me a better estimate? Now you know. But they are not looking, that's why no one is able to tell me. So, inertia of the motor is reflected at the link by, it's not a torque, it's not going to be reflected by N, because the motor is moving much faster. The, the acceleration at the, the joint is moving also s slower by the, that gear ratio. So, the effective inertia reflected by the motor is how many times I am? N square. Much better. 
So you have a gear ratio of 100. It is big. The coefficient that you are going to carry is really big. And that makes the robot very dangerous, actually. Because the effective inertia that you see at the joint is correlated with the impact force that you might produce if you have uh, a sudden collision. And if you are reflecting this small inertia by n square of the gear ratio, you're going to produce a large impact force. So here is the analysis. We can write the dynamic equation on the side of the motor, or we can write it on the side of the link. And when we write it on the side of the link, we see that it's IL plus N square or eta square IM. And this is your effective inertia. <coughs> now, your effective inertia is always by the square of the gear ratio of the motor you are using. Well, the direct drive case is uh, really ideal. We use it with SCARA type robots where you do not have to carry the gravity. But with the robots that are articulated and that need to move in space, it's very difficult to build robots that have big motors and can carry uh, the structure. Now, variation of the effective inertia makes it that if you have variation of your IL, IL is going to change. IM is constant, it's the same motor. So the question is, if IL is changing, what is the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is changing your time response because your KP, if you remember, is M times KP prime. So it affects directly your omega. So you might do an analysis and see if you are using constant gains that the best way to select your gain is to go to the geometric average and look at your minimum, the minimum value of your IL and the maximum value of your IL and take that uh, mid-range in geometric sense and that gives you some uh, estimate that you can, you can use over all the range of motion. Okay, well, I think uh, we are coming to a point where we can break. So let me remind, mo remind you uh, that next Tuesday and Wednesday we will have the review sessions. And uh, on Monday we will be signing up for those review sessions. So please, those of you who are not here, please make sure you come and sign up. See you on Monday. <laughs>